It's now late Saturday afternoon, about 3.30 in the still sweltering but pleasant Bali heat. And although there's a few administrative details yet to be completed, it looks like we finally have a climate change roadmap agreement out of these negotiations called the Bali Roadmap. The dynamic this afternoon and really this morning has been over the statement of common but differentiated responsibilities. The negotiations were scheduled to be completed as of Friday yesterday. They dragged on all through the night on Friday night um, into Saturday today and well into Saturday afternoon. The United States had already succeeded in seriously watering down the reference to the International uh, Panel on Climate Change fourth report, fourth assessment report that talked about the need for an immediate by 2020 25 to 40 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and they ended up succeeding in getting that down to a footnote essentially rather taking it out of the the uh, introduction preamble to the final uh, statement of this this meeting and getting it in just as a footnote okay that's pretty depressing you start with that but since the US had gotten that then where we found us ourselves was that this whole topic of common but differentiated responsibilities was playing out in the final text. There are two sections in um, section 1B1 and 1B2 and 1B1 had to do with the developed country parties and it had read that there would be measurable, reportable, verifiable, nationally appropriate mitigation commitments or action including quantified emission limitation and reduction objectives by all developed country parties while ensuring the comparability of efforts among them and then this final phrase taking into account differences in the national circumstances now interestingly that's there for the powerful developed countries but then the next clause was one that had a similar content uh, context measurable reportable and verifiable nationally appropriate mitigation actions by developing country parties in the context of sustainable development supported by technology and enabled by financing and capacity building all that's great because we talked about it in context of sustainable development but the draft did not have similar language saying taking into account differences in their national circumstances and this is something that the developing countries have been arguing for uh, throughout this process because uh, this is indeed in their understanding the embodiment of the common but differentiated responsibilities so it came down to that point where uh, the negotiations stalled during the course of the day the G77 countries plus China went off and were discussing how to come up with alternative language for this and ultimately when they came back to the plenary session the there was an amendment proposed by India that the uh, sentiment be brought back in for the developing countries to also acknowledge that they have their own particular circumstances. Now the political game along these lines in part was an attempt I think by uh, the US, Canada, some of the other powerful countries to push on the uh, developing countries and force them into a mold that they weren't really ready for. Uh, some of that subtext, sub rosa is the US versus China dynamic, etc. The G77 countries said unless we make this change we can't agree to this. They had already been kind of politically stalemated because the U.S. had already won their uh, dynamic of taking the IPCC statement down into a footnote. So now, were the G77 countries going to kill the agreement? Uh, they certainly didn't want to. So what happened is uh, India goes ahead and proposes amendment, and there was a big debate then at that point on should that amendment be accepted. And essentially what happened in, in that uh, discussion is this whole business about taking into account differences in national circumstances ended up being uh, put into the introductory section to that whole section so that there wasn't a difference in that concept between the developed uh, country parties and the developing country parties. So we got into the debate at that point and uh, the EU endorsed what the uh, India amendment uh, backed by some of these other countries, uh, Bangladesh supported them, uh, they, they supported that. Philippines came on board, supported it, the Maldive, uh, Maldive Islands supported it. Um, so we kind of went through this debate and then what ended up happening is the United States came along and there's all this momentum, we think we're going to get to an agreement. Now picture this, this is already late, uh, early Saturday afternoon. We are a half day past the end of the negotiations. People aren't committed to be here any longer. We're in danger of having absolutely no agreement if the United States goes ahead and kills it. People are going to leave. Uh, the United States would be essentially unilaterally going against the international community by killing this and not having, by having this at the absolute 11th hour, not having a possibility of going ahead and, and getting an agreement because everybody would leave. So 
what happens then is the United States gets out there and says, you know, we really don't support this. Um, it ends up not being fair. It's a not enough commitment uh, from the developing countries, and we really want a, a shared responsibility. Now, you know, the irony, of course, is that the United States had been cutting the reference to the real commitments that we all need to make on a global level, and then they're here spouting off about how, oh, there wasn't enough commitment by the developing countries. So what happens then is, uh, and they're saying, well, this now makes it unbalanced, somehow that it's unbalanced because the developed countries, um, you know, ironically, the developed countries had the ability to look at their national circumstances, but there wasn't the same sort of qualification for the developing countries, and the U.S. is calling that, um, you know, that's imbalanced. So, you know, the, the, the developing countries were trying to balance it back so everybody has the same sort of criteria, the old common but differentiated responsibilities. Okay, so what happens then is the United States makes its statement, and after we had this whole momentum of one cheer after another, one national, uh, you know, one country after another saying, let's go with this consensus, the United States speaks, and the place just erupts in booze. And, you know, this is a big international event. You have a certain level of decorum. It was pretty in intense to hear the booze. I was up in the, in the press row up on the top, and there were even some journalists there booing. Normally you don't, you don't hear that sort of thing. So then what happens is um, Japan makes some non-committal statement that really meant nothing, maybe trying to uh, help the United States a little bit, and then comes South Africa. South Africa went ahead and said that the science on this issue is absolutely clear and that the United States reference to developing countries not doing their part is unwelcome and without basis. When they said that, the place erupted in shares. The, um, it was incredible. The energy that went through that building when, when the, uh, the U.S. went ahead, or excuse me, when South Africa made that statement about the United States, the place just erupted and it really, um, you know, the, the energy just flowed, again, even in the, in the press row. Uh, you could really feel that this was a real debate now. There weren't just diplomatic statements, diplomatic um, diplomatic speeches going back and forth, but it was truly a, a serious, honest, heart-to-heart -heart debate. Now, there's a whole line of other countries that comes in and, again, says the U.S. is wrong, this is uh, totally inappropriate. Brazil comes in and uh, says, again, that they add their voice to the voice of the G77 to the EU, and their quote then was that, those countries that have historical responsibilities for the climate change problem must take responsibility and do their part. Of course, this was referring to the United States. The place just broke out in, in applause. It was incredible. I said to one of the journalists sitting by me, you know, we're going to look back on this like the people did about uh, Woodstock and said, you know, I was there that time because it was a, a magical moment. You felt goosebumps. Uh, all these people, UN, different faces, the essentially the faces of our, our, our planet, of our species, everybody cheering. So then um, a couple countries then proposed that, well, could the um, United States go ahead and um, and I'm just sitting here looking at my notes, could the United States uh, go ahead and agree, stand aside so they don't block the consensus and then attach some sort of statement about how they interpret it so that it can allow them to save some face. I immediately uh, flash back to the Bush signing statements where when he signs a law into effect and then he adds something back in the U.S. said, well, we're, you know, I'm signing this into law, but I'm not committing to follow it as an executive order. So I got a little worried about uh, offering that sort of thing to the United States. Well. Then we went ahead and we heard a few more countries, and then Papua New Guinea spoke. Papua New Guinea at that point said there's that old adage that, you know, if, if you're willing to lead, lead, but if you're not willing to lead, then get out of the way. And basically, the Papua New Guinea uh, delegate then said, United States, if you're not willing to need, lead on this, you need to get out of the way. Here's a little small Pacific Island state uh, speaking to the big giant United States. It was a very, very powerful moment. Again, the place erupted in, in cheers. So the debate continued to play out with all these countries around the world uh, going ahead and telling the United States that it was wrong. And, one of the uh, most interesting comments came from the Egyptian delegate when she said, this is like a movie, she felt like she was watching a movie, there are all sorts of subplots going on here, and it was, as you're hearing, different cult cultures, different countries talking from their own backgrounds, but ultimately all coming together. So at that point, after the United States was roundly rejected by the international community, roundly criticized 
for essentially putting itself in a place to block everything, Paula Dabrowski, the United States uh, chief negotiator, came forward and made uh, for the U.S. a face-saving statement talking about how so much had been accomplished, how they felt that they had common goals or a common approach now to reach common goals and that they were going to go ahead and agree to the statement. So incredibly, after all of that, uh, the United States had found itself uh, isolated. The United States did get a lot in terms of watering down the agreement, certainly not acknowledging the severity of the problem and not having any specific targets at this point, but really just describing a roadmap. Nevertheless, the key categories uh, about uh, dealing with adaptability and mitigation and technology transfers and financing and ultimately dealing with, with, with climate change, greenhouse gas emission reductions, the categories were in there. The principle, again, of common but differentiated responsibilities did end up playing out in the last version. It took the rest of the world versus the United States. But at this point, now here in Bali, we can say a half day later that we ended up with an agreement. And at that point, you have to hope that uh, Gaia Mother Earth came through for us and we got something that I think a lot of people didn't believe that we would ever get. People, I think, as of last night when people were negotiating all night felt the United States was going to kill this. Maybe it's the domestic situation in the United States where if the U.S. had killed this, it would have handed the presidential race to the Democrats. Maybe it's just Mother Earth speaking through the delegates here. But in the end, we've got an agreement, and let's go forward to Copenhagen in 2009 and hope we can get something that really works for this planet. This is Mike Feinstein signing off in Bali.